The gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks, flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But as midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamp, lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, No, there will be not enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding ban banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Thanks be to God. Anybody in the mood to pray for the preacher this morning? Here comes Alexa. Lord, I thank you for this day that we have to gather together to worship you. I thank you for the pastor you've sent to us to help us understand your message for us. I thank you for the love we have for each other and the opportunities to let that love grow and to show it and to spread it all around. Please. Speak to us through Terry today. Bless her as you bless us with your message of love. In Jesus' name, amen. I often say that I have two favorite Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and it goes back and forth between the two. This passage today is why I really love Luke's Gospel. This is a tough passage to hear, isn't it? Both of them, Amos from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and this passage from Matthew. We have three parables coming up. It's the first of three from the 25th chapter of Matthew. What happens in the 26th chapter of Matthew? Does anybody know? It begins the passion of Jesus, the time of his death. And the Christian year is scheduled such that we come up to the end of his life, and then we start the season of Advent. Who knows what Advent is about? What is Advent? Maybe you know what Advent is? Okay, she says the time before Jesus is born and the times when the kings go to search for him. That's Epiphany, which is right after Christmas, but you got a good idea. But sometimes we treat it like it's a baby shower for Mary, right? It's the time to bake our Christmas cookies and get our houses all decorated and things like that. It's not about, Advent is not about looking back. It's about looking forward. Advent is the church's yearly proclamation of the second coming of Christ. And if we're honest, we, we want Jesus to come, right? Amen? But not necessarily right now, right? Amen? Well, we're honest. We don't want to see all that. We want to be here with our families, right? Especially during Christmas when everything is warm and fuzzy and lovely. These are not warm and fuzzy, lovely passages. This is a passage, this one from Matthew, this parable that scholars don't even agree on. I spent hours yesterday watching different um, presentations on this, not just sermons. I don't really try to watch anybody else's sermon on this, but I looked at exegetical resources online, things like that. This is one that nobody agrees on what it means exactly. 
lots of people think it's about the rapture, and I don't know if you believe in the rapture or not, but I don't think it's biblical. I think it's something that people sort of put together out of little passages here and there and everywhere. I don't think the rapture is a scriptural um, reality with thousand years tribulation and all this other stuff. I don't think that's how Christ is going to return. And in fact, it says, Jesus says again and again, I tell you truly, um, you don't know what, I do not know you. He always says to them, I don't know, you don't know when it's going to be, you know, neither the day nor the hour. Keep awake, therefore, if you do know neither the day nor the hour. He says that again and again to them. He says to them, only the Father in heaven knows when the Son's going to return. And the disciples now must be very confused because they don't even, they're not even sure Jesus is going to go anywhere, right? They think he's going to restore the kingdom and everything's going to be great right now. But this is talking about the second coming after his crucifixion and his resurrection. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Now, how many of you have ever been a bridesmaid? I was a bridesmaid professionally back in the day. I wore the ugliest dresses in the 1970s you can imagine. Teresa's back there going, amen, amen, amen. Those of us from that era wore some really scary, big old floppy hats with butterflies and veils and stuff like that. But um, not the same as a bridesmaid then. And sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the, the ten virgins, the wise and foolish virgins. Bridesmaids in those days were not bridesmaids like now. Their job was to light the way for the bridegroom and his procession through the town. And that's what they're waiting for him to do so they can have their lamps trimmed. And lamps, what kind of lamps were they? They had these little clay lanterns that they carry in their hand that filled with oil and had a wick. That was one kind. But this could be more of a torch situation. This is probably a torch because the same word is used in Greek for both lantern and torch where you have a stick, a big, thick stick, and you wrap some fabric around the end of it, and you dip it in some sort of oil and light it so you could light up a lot of places. And that's sort of what they would use for a processional. And how many of you think this doesn't seem like Jesus at all? Because what happens when they go to sleep, and they all sleep, right? It's not like just five of them fell asleep on the job. They, they wake up, and five were not prepared, and five were prepared. And they say they're wise and foolish. And you've got to take this in the context of all of Matthew's Gospel. Now, where have we heard about wise and foolish people in Matthew's Gospel before in another short little story from the, again, from the Sermon on the Mount? Wise and foolish who? The wise man built his house upon the rock. That is from the same teaching of Jesus. Those who hear my words and do them are like the wise man who built his house on the rock. When the winds came and the floods rose and the water crashed against it, it stood firm. Those who hear my words and ignore them are like the foolish man who built his house where? On the sand. And the winds came and the floods rose up and the house went flat. Right? It's like that children's song. But Jesus is saying wise and foolish again. The wise are the ones who hear my word and do it. The foolish are the ones who hear my word and let it go in one ear and out the other. And he's been saying to be prepared, to be prepared, to be prepared. And Five of the bridesmaids are prepared and five are not prepared. Now, how many of you think it's counterintuitive for Jesus to say a story where they don't share the oil? They don't share the oil, do they? Wouldn't you think they'd want to share that oil with the others? Wouldn't that be the Christian thing to do, Jesus, to share our oil? But they're saying, no, if we share our oil, what's going to happen? They're all going to go out. They don't have enough. And they send them off to buy oil which is kind of funny because it's not midnight like 12 a.m. Midnight means well into the night in this context. Like 10,000 just means a huge number. It's not exact, but it's saying well into the night because Jesus said you don't know the hour when he's returning. So here he is coming well into the night, and there was not, I can tell you this for sure, an all-night Walmart in Palestine at this time. So they sent him off to buy oil, which means they had to knock on the door, wake somebody up and say, sell some oil, we've got to go to the bride's, we got to get the bridegroom. I said last week about parables, and the week before and the week before that, when we're talking about parables, we're not doing an exact thing here. We're not saying this is this person or this is that person. Other than the bridegroom is pretty obviously Jesus, right? And you have to know that a wedding in the first century was a huge deal, not just, not just a party, not just 
didn't make your vows and do the reception and cut the cake and go home or on your honeymoon. It could last for days and there were contractual obligations to fulfill and the groom would be there and he was delayed and then he comes and that's when there's trouble because the bridesmaids are locked out. And Jesus says to them, I don't know you, get away. You're not part of my party anymore and he shuts the door. Not a very Jesus thing to do, right? takes us back to that part in Amos where God is saying, these are the words of the Lord spoken through the prophet Amos. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. That means your worship. I don't give two hoots about your worship service. I don't give two hoots about your singing. What is the, the God's looking for? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If anybody knows any line from Amos, that's the one they know. Let justice roll down like waters. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God cares a lot more about how we treat each other justly than he cares about our worship. That's hard to think, isn't it? Because we like to worship well. We like to sing beautifully, which I did not do this morning without the music. But um, here we are in the same situation all these thousands of years later. What do we, how do we apply this to our lives? Because it's not like a wedding now, and it's not like the world now, because Christ has come and Christ has been raised. So what do we do about this? That's why I picked the sermon title, Sleep at the Switch. Anybody know what that switch is up there on the picture? The train switch. What does the train switch do, Clark, you know? Very good. Stand up and come up here and say that in my mic boy who knows trains. My father would have been so impressed with you. It switches the track so that the train can go like this way instead of going straight. Okay, what if you fall asleep at the switch? What if you don't do the switch at the right time? What's going to happen? Then the train goes the wrong way. What could happen then if the train goes the wrong way? Then people don't get where they need to go on time. Or worse than that, what else could happen? Think about that. What do you think, Kaylee? Okay, they could go over the wrong bridge and fall and die. If the bridge is out, they could do that. But they could hit another train, or they could derail or something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. We've got some train experts here up front. Asleep at the switch doesn't mean that they fell asleep, because all those bridesmaids fell asleep. Sleep at the switch means they were unattentive to what was required of them. And you can be asleep at the switch and be wide awake, can't you? Anybody here ever been asleep at the switch and let something happen that shouldn't happen because you weren't paying attention? You gotta be attentive, Jesus is saying. You gotta be pay attention to what's happening in the world around you. You gotta pay attention, and listen for my voice above all other voices in the world. So he says, Keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, awake and woke, boy, those are some loaded words anymore, aren't they? How many of you think the word woke is a dirty word now? Raise your hand if you feel that. Okay, we got some people out there saying, yep. Anywhere that started, other than in scripture about keeping awake? In a um, presidential election in the past, 1860, it's a Republican saying the wake up boys who were in favor of who would the Republicans be voting for in 1860, do you think? Lincoln. They were, the, they were the abolitionists who were supporting Abraham Lincoln for president. They wanted people to stay awake. They wanted people to be attentive to what was happening to slaves in the South. That's what they were asking for. And that's all that the woke movement became about. And it, that's something that's been with the black community for years and years and years. Suddenly now it's a bad thing because it means that you're supposed to hate yourself because you're white. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that at all. If you're white, because I found out when I did my genealogy that I am the descendant of slave owner, Alan Hash, my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's maternal grandfather owned slaves, eight slaves, or he thought he did, because I don't think human beings really can own a human being. But he thought he owned eight people, and he was a Confederate wagoneer, and he made people make wagons for the Confederacy. So these were people who he claimed to own and forced to work against their own people. Am I responsible for what he did? No, I'm not. But I'm responsible for what happens to the next generation and the one after that. 
I was in seminary before I learned who Emmett Till was because it wasn't taught in Delaney High School or even Towson University in my history class. But I give thanks to God for Stephen Umstead, who was my ninth grade social studies teacher who showed us films of the Holocaust. Because when I saw those, something clicked in my head and said, God does not want the world to be like this. God does not want the world to be like this. I gotta do something about it. Jesus said, wake up, Terry, and be attentive to what's going on in other people's lives. Don't let it happen again. And because we have now these laws about anti-woke laws and things like that, you've seen what's happened on college campuses, haven't you, with Jewish students lately? They're being beaten, they're being attacked, they're being humiliated on campus by people who do not remember the facts of history. We can't let that happen. We've got to be attentive, folks. We've got to be awake. So if you think woke is a dirty word, I'm sorry, because I don't think it started out that way. I think that's something somebody else wanted to stop it so that things can happen again and again and again in history. Swastik is being painted on the doors of synagogues across America. The incidence of anti-Semitism and attacks on Jews has gone up 400% since the 7th of October. Jesus wants us to be awake to the needs of other people and to the needs of the world. You don't have to say you're woke. If you don't like that, that's fine. I mean, you have to go to Black Lives Matters rally, although I did go to one in Cockeysville, Maryland, when George Floyd was killed. You know who was there? Mostly white folks. with their little children saying, we've got to stand up for each other in this community, and I think that's a great thing. I know there are people who don't want to hear about this anymore. They're tired of it. We've got to stand up for other folks. We've got to be attentive to what goes on in the world around us because if we're not, then we're sleeping and Jesus is going to come and find us asleep. Now there is good news in this story. As sad as it is, he's delayed in coming, right? The bridegroom? Jesus has not returned yet. And it says that he is going to come back and we've got to have the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ that he is going to return and set the world right. But it also says that God does not have unlimited patience with us. God has a lot of patience with us. The reason the bridegroom is delayed in this case, in our case, is that God has given us a chance to proclaim the gospel. And in light of the gospel, what else is in that um, Sermon on the Mount? Jesus says, you are the what of the world to the people? You're the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Who lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel? No, they light it and put it on a lamp and it gives light to everyone in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before others that they see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That is what Jesus says earlier in the gospel. So he's saying, do not let your lamp go out. Don't let your torch go out. Because if you do, then you have failed the world. This is about doing things for others, not, not just for ourselves. It's not until we get into heaven. It's not about that at all. It's about lighting the way for others to see the, clearly who Christ is the one who believes in justice and righteousness and wants justice to roll down from heaven like water. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Hard passage, isn't it? It's a little easier next week, but then the next week is a real killer. And maybe you don't agree with my interpretation of this, and I have studied this passage so many times I don't know what to make of it anymore, other than we're the bridesmaids. Of us, whether we're going to be wise or foolish, whether we're going to be attentive to the needs of others or we're going to be attentive to our own situation. Sort of like the guy in the, the tithing story this morning, our, our tithing joke du jour. We can either be concerned with our own boats and our own season tickets to the Ravens or the Orioles or whatever you want to get season tickets to. We can be all about ourselves and what we need and want and that or we can share our wealth with the world. Not just your material goods. It's not about that. I want you to share Jesus Christ with the world. Share Christ with the world so your light does not go out. Because there will come a time when Jesus says enough is enough. And I want to be found on the right side of that day. I'm sure you do too. Amen? Amen.